Hello everyone, I'm Sarah Shaffey and I'm here with Luanne Goldie and we're going to talk about Luanne's novel, These Streets. Hi Luanne. Hiya. Um, can you tell us about the inspiration for the novel, please? Yeah, when I write, I always start with my characters. So I had this family in my head, which is Jess, the mum, and her two teenage children, Jacob and Hazel. And I could just see them. I could see into their home and I could hear the kind of conversations they were having and just see a glimpse of their everyday life. And I was sort of writing little bits and pieces around them. At the same time I started writing about this family, a friend of mine who lives in Stratford, she was going through all these problems with her landlord. She was privately renting. And then it was a conversation I kept having with other people around East London that were privately renting. They were worried about their tenancy agreements. They were worried about their rent going up hugely because Stratford is one of these areas where everybody wants to live all of a sudden. And then at one point, they just sort of linked up this family I had, Jess and her kids, and this issue with um, not knowing how long you were going to have your home for. That's how the novel came about. So you mentioned home there, and in a lot of ways, this is a story about home. What were you trying to say about the places and people that make home for us? When I write, I don't really have like a particular message that I'm trying to get across. It really is driven by the characters exploring what's happening in their life, in their world. Throughout the story, I feel like Jess's idea of home changes a lot. At the start, she's really like, well, this is my home this place with this living room, this kitchen, these bedrooms, this is where we live, this is our home. But as the family get bounced around between places, she sort of finds out that home is wherever she is with her kids. And maybe I wouldn't have thought that when I started writing. So it kind of changed as I was going through the writing of it and getting to know them more. Mm, I guess that sort of reflects Jess's journey as well, that it changes yeah, as, she, as she goes through the story. Um, Jess and Ben, so uh, Jess, you've already mentioned, and Ben, the other protagonist, are really at the centre of the novel. One of the things that makes it so brilliant are the children of the book, and particularly Jess's teenage children, Hayes and Jacob, who I think we spend a lot of time with. We we don't spend as much time with Ben's little girl, Olivia, although we hear a lot about her. Um, how did you go about ensuring that the voices of the teenagers in particular felt really authentic and didn't feel like an adult writing? Right. <laughs> you think a teenage, like, did you do lots of research? Are you kind of eavesdropping on conversations you're hearing? <laughs> Just really listening to teenagers and listening to what's going on in, in their lives. With Jess, the idea of a mum, because I'm a mum, the idea that you could lose your home, I'm going to react to that in a very different way compared to a, a teenager, right? Even if you're a teenager and there's a threat you're going to lose your home, you're still worrying about other things. So I spoke to um, teenagers and young people that have been in this situation that have lived in hostels, that have been moved around different places and sort of listened to how they experienced it, which was so different to how the parents experienced it. Even listening to young people on the bus, you know, it's that thing that writers do. You listen to how they talk, what's important to them. And for Jacob in particular, I spoke to a group of young boys. It was mostly boys who, because Jacob in the book, he wears a cochlear implant. So he experiences the world very differently to his sister. So I spoke to a group of teenagers about their experiences about that as well. So I really wanted to get it right. How important um, was it and how meaningful was it for you to have these direct conversations as part of your, your research for this novel? It is it's so important. Well, when I first started writing, I don't think I realised how important it was. But as I've gone along, I'm very, very careful about the research now, and especially with Jacob. I was quite paranoid about it. And at some points I didn't almost want to write that character because I felt the pressure of I've got to get this right. But when I write the characters, I feel like I don't actually have much choice because I knew that's who he was. He does have this and I have to get it right. So that's why I made sure I did my research. And then after I spoke to the young boys about their experiences of wearing a, a cochlear implant, then I felt the weight even more of having to get it right. Because I sort of said to them, give me some examples of like good representation. You know, what have you guys watched or read where you felt, oh, this really represents a part of me and my life experiences? And they all said, oh, there's nothing. <laughs> so they was like, oh, no. They were like, yeah, there's nothing. And then there was one example they had of a, a, a deaf kid at school who gets really badly bullied. They were like, oh, yeah, yeah, we all saw that in a film. I was like, oh, no, there's nothing. Like, I really have to get this right. So, um, yeah, it is important to 
to do the research, also just to talk to the young people that are living their lives this way. Mm. It's really interesting because in the novel, I love that very small scene between Jacob and Stedman, his father, and Stedman's sort of like, you hate parties. And Jacob's like, no, I love parties. And if it... (laughs) But Stedman's like, it's too noisy for you. And he's like, well, I'll just switch my cochlear implant off if it's too noisy. And I feel like that is the kind of little touch that only would have come from you speaking to people. Yeah. So I went in with all these big, heavy questions. And they're still teenagers. And when I did the research, it was like at the height of the pandemic where we had limited groups of um, children in school and they're wearing masks and I'm like trying to ask all these really intelligent questions. And they're like, "Mm," you know, they're tuning out or they're chatting to each other they're signing over me and oh man (laughs) they're just teenagers yeah teenagers have got a teenage whatever the case might be (laughs) have um have any of them sort of read the novel or bits of the novel and kind of come back to you at all not yet so this is the old school that I used to work at so I'm going back in to see them I think next month because you know what the thing about teenagers is they probably won't read the novel they'll be like oh yeah whatever I was like, I'll bring you guys some donuts. Yeah, we're interested in that. (laughs) Amazing. So we've talked about Hayes and Jacob and Jess and Ben. Family is really key to this book. And throughout the book, we sort of see families bending and breaking and reforming. Can you talk a little bit about the ways in which the characters sort of blend and build families, which are sort of healthier than the families we perhaps meet at the beginning of the novel? It was important to be um, truthful about the family that it's not all wonderful and you don't always want to spend time with your parents, even though you know you should. So with Jess, her dad is quite a difficult person. They don't have the best relationship, but he's an old man. He's on his own and she feels obligated to spend all this time with him and to to have a good relationship with him and make sure that her children have this really great relationship with him. But I did want to show as well that that can be quite tiring and quite draining, right? I'm sure a lot of people could relate to that. You might have people in your family that don't particularly want to be with them that much but they might be vulnerable they need your help they're they're lonely so you do um put a lot of energy into spending time with them so that's something that I, I hope comes across it's not all perfect all the time it definitely does um you've already addressed perspective I think from the point of view of teenagers might see something quite differently but I think memory and perspective play a big role in the novel in terms of sort of what people remember and how they choose to remember it and can you talk a little bit about that idea of sort of so for example Ben chooses to repress some memories Jess doesn't really like to talk about the past Wolf, when when we first meet him, basically lies to Ben about having a son as a sort of erasure of the past. So can you talk a little bit about all those different aspects of memory mm. and perspective? Yeah, they're all very different, the main characters in this novel and how they deal with things. I think with someone like Jess, she's got so much on. She's trying to look after her kids. Um, she's sorting out all this stuff with her house, with her work. She doesn't really have that much time to reflect on the past but it feels like it's following her around she can't get away from it and that's something I think a lot of people would relate to that you sometimes your past can just pop back up and it always comes at the worst possible time as well right so that's what happens to her she's just trying to get on with things and get through her everyday life which is already quite difficult and then this thing about her brother keeps popping back up right in her face and she can't ignore it So I wanted to show that. Whereas Wolf, he doesn't want to deal with it. I think he's quite embarrassed, um, quite ashamed of that he failed with his son. So he just denies it. So yeah, they're all very different in how they um, deal with their past or how they don't deal with their past. (laughs) Indeed. There's um, a lot of sort of old and new hurts in the novel and there's no easy way for your characters to kind of get past these apart from to face them and come to terms with them and and forgive that forgiveness might be forgiving themselves or it might be forgiving others now that you've come to the the end of writing the novel and you're looking back at it what do you think you and the novel say about acceptance and forgiveness I think some of the characters they move on I don't know how much they forgive there's the last chapter and we see where we leave them but what happens next I think for Jess what she went through with her older brother and even a relationship with her own father it would just be an ongoing thing it's not really like a specific point where she's like oh I'm over it it just keeps going on I imagine with Ben as well even though we see him at the end of the novel in a different place 
I think it would be a process that goes beyond the novel of him um, forgiving and moving on. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, they all went through a lot. So I don't really see the end point. I never see an end point for my characters. I just imagine they're still getting on with their lives somewhere. And I, th- I think that's great, though, because obviously you are writing a work of fiction and often fiction does like to tie things up very neatly with a bow at the end but how important to you is it that there's an element of realism there even though you are writing a made-up story that things don't end on that last line of that last page they do carry on afterwards yeah well they have to because for me they're so real so even if I do tie up nicely they're so real Of course, they're still going on. (laughs) They're still having the conversations and arguing with each other and falling out and having an amazing time with each other. They're just there existing somewhere. But I I do hope I've tied up the novel to a point so it's satisfying for a reader. But for me, I could definitely picture them carrying on with their lives and having other experiences. I love that. Do you still hear them as characters after you, at this stage, this level after finishing the novel, or are they now... I try not to, because I've got to move on and write something else. <laughs> I try not to. But it's weird, because it's like, this is my third book now, so there are certain characters that, that stay with me. Um, and then there's others who I totally forget about. And sometimes, especially with my first book, Nightingale Point, because it was lots of different characters, um, people who've read that book, they, they seem to latch on to a particular voice. So people will email me, people will come up to me and they'll say, I love so-and-so. And And sometimes I'm like, what are they talking about? Especially after the pandemic, you know, where you weren't really seeing people. I wasn't doing book events. Then you go back out and people want to talk to you about this specific character. Why did they do this? And And I'm like, I just don't know who they're talking about. I really can't remember this person. Whereas others really, really stay with me, really stay with me. And I I think about them, which is strange. Oh, it's not strange. I don't think it's strange. Um, These Streets deals with quite a lot of big and serious issues such as homelessness and trauma. How did you go about ensuring that those things were sort of part of the book and part of your character's lives without overtaking the novel so that the novel became sort of a book about issues rather than a book about character, which I think Mm, it definitely is. But I think this is a really difficult thing. Um, You could speak to anyone and they could tell you like, really horrible things that have happened in their life, but that doesn't define them, right? So we see this family going through all these horrible things, but they're still living their everyday life and laughing with each other and having fun and falling in love. And, you know, that's just normal life. Your everyday continues. And I I think that's in a lot of my writing. There are big issues, but I don't feel like I'm writing about big issues. I'm just writing about the people, these really lovely people, but this horrible thing is happening to them. How do they get through it? You touched on this uh, slightly earlier. There's a lot of humour in this book. There's a lot of warmth. There are a lot of laughs. Why was it really important to you that the book have that sort of aspect of of fun and and, and humour and, and jokes and kind of characters who might occasionally do something ridiculous or say something ridiculous? Yeah. I don't think I could write, like spend that long on a book however many years we spend thinking and writing a book, if it was just all hard. And that's just not real life either for your average family. That is not real life. Even when tough things are happening, you are still laughing with each other. You're still doing normal stuff. I can't read these books where it's just bleak all the way through and nobody smiles and no one fancies anyone else or slaps their little brother and playfully. Do you know what I mean? Because it's not real life. And I do like to show that working class communities, there is a lot of laugh and humour and warmth because there is a stereotype that it's just all grim. And people shouting at each other. You watch EastEnders, everyone's just shouting at each other all the time. Why are they always shouting? So I do want to show just a normal family in there. They're laughing. Yeah, it's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And it just wouldn't be realistic if it was just grim. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the other things that's a big part of a lot of the characters' lives is art in some form. So Wolf is a big fan of old Hollywood. Hazel loves Hamilton the musical. Both Jacob and Hazel love K-pop. Jess works in theatre. Why did you want to get that sort of aspect of art into the novel? And how many of those things are you a fan of as well? I didn't even think of that. I didn't even think of that. But yeah, Wolf is, he's obsessed with like the golden age of Hollywood. I used to have a media teacher who obsessed, just completely obsessed with the golden age of Hollywood and we really didn't get it. I remember being students and watching these films and 
we just didn't get it. But I love that idea that someone can be so obsessed with something and they try to share it with other people and just like, I don't get it at all. But I didn't really think of that, that they were all a bit obsessive about certain things. Yeah, that's interesting. But I am obviously a big K-pop fan. I wasn't trying to put it in the novel on purpose. <laughs> you know, they're teenagers. Yeah. And I'm a big Hamilton fan as well. So maybe, yeah, it seeped in a little bit. I did feel I was reading sort of Air uh, Hayes's constantly putting on Hamilton and I was like that was me like the first year after I heard Hamilton it was on all the time everywhere <laughs> um, I like it for Hayes because it doesn't quite suit her because she tries to be so like sassy and super cool about everything and um, so highbrow but she she just loves that musical theatre vibe as well yeah it's really cool and um, finally what do you want people to take away from the novel what is there something in particular you want them thinking or feeling when they sort of turn that that last page, turn the back cover and shut the book or finish the audio book or the ebook. Um, I'm not sure, but I think just I've had so many conversations with people that have gone through sort of a similar thing to what Jess goes through, this not knowing what's going to happen with your home. I would like people to think about homelessness a bit bigger than what we do. We automatically think street homelessness. But it's so much bigger than that. It is so much bigger than that. Especially in East London, you know, in Stratford where the book's set and there's this old shopping centre and at, at night they have rough sleepers in there. I mean, that's so shocking because you see all these guys because it is all men in the centre. It is really, really shocking. And when they were printing the photos of the men in the newspapers, they're sleeping outside the shop. It is really shocking. But it's also shocking that a mum and her two kids get stuck in a hostel where they're all sharing a bedroom, that a teenage boy is sharing a bedroom with his teenage sister who's doing exams, and they're sharing a bathroom with four other families. That's also really, really shocking. So I just want people to think about it a little bit. It's so much bigger than the street homelessness, the rough sleepers we see. And it, it's all bad. It's not like oh, I'm trying to show this is worse than what we're used to. But I just want people to think about how much of a bigger issue this is that we're, that we're facing. And it could happen to anyone, which is the scariest part about it. So we all need to think about it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And I hope everyone enjoys reading these streets as much as I did. Thank you.